Perfect. Good afternoon. Today is August 22nd, 2024. My name is Greg Sperling and I'm a volunteer at the Stratford Veterans Museum located at 5952 Main Street here in Stratford, Connecticut. I'm joined today by former U.S. Air Force Sergeant Robert Meachin, who was born on April 11th, 1948 in Bridgeport, Connecticut and served in the Air Force from 1967 to 1970. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, tell us a little bit about growing up. Uh, you were born in Bridgeport. And uh, I was born in Bridgeport. Um, I grew up uh, in Paradise Green till I was nine. And then my dad moved us out to Lordship, built a house out there, moved out there, um, stayed there, had a great childhood on the beaches and whatnot in Lordship. Uh, can't go wrong. Uh, and then uh, went to... Uh, Went to St. Joe's. My mom wanted me to go to a Catholic high school, so mm -hmm. uh, St. Joe. I really wanted to go to Fairfield Prep, but that particular year was when they started St. Joe's, and so we were the first graduating class of St. Joe's, and so I went to uh, St. Joe's instead of Stratford High for the first two years. But unfortunately, they wouldn't give me any college courses because of my entrance exams, and so after the second year, there was really no way of going to college without getting college courses. So my mom and I uh, met with the principal up at St. Joe's and said, you know, can we change? And he said, no, you can't. So we said, okay, we're out of here. So I went to Stratford High for my last two years. But again, going to a Catholic high school for the first two years, there's credits that I'll never get back for uh, religion, right. etc. Right. So I ended up taking uh, algebra, physics, and, and geometry in my my senior year, which was impossible. Yeah. So uh, by the time uh, graduation rolled around, I had, to, I had to graduate, I had to go to summer school to graduate geometry. And by then, the draft was rampant. And uh, I didn't really want to get drafted. So uh, a friend of mine uh, and myself, Art Rassius from Lordship, decided that we would enlist. And at least we get to pick and choose where we wanted to go. So my brother was in the Navy, and so I said, well, you know, let's, let's go to the Navy. Got bell bottom <laughs> pants, and, you know. It went with the times, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and so we went to the Navy, and Navy couldn't take us for a year. There were that many people trying to get out of, not get out of the draft, but, you know. Yes, get into the Navy, yeah. So then we went to the Army, we went to the Marines, and the, the Air Force was the soonest we can get in. And that was in, like, I think five or six months, so I didn't get in there until January of 67. Uh, so I went to the Air Force. And coming out of, we had boot camp at uh, uh, San, uh, San Antonio. And coming out of boot camp, uh, they said, well, what, do, what would you like to do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, I'd like to be a photo mapper. And they said, fine, but you need a top secret security clearance. So I was adopted. So everybody else had their assignments and they were going their merry ways, and I still hadn't been picked. And they finally came to me and said, we have a problem because of your adoption. We can only go back so far in your history. We can give you a secret, but we can't give you a top secret. So when everything was said and done, all the other choices had been picked. The only thing left was copper or cook. So <laughs> I said, well, I don't want to be a cook for four years. So, uh, you know, I can make a peanut butter jelly sandwich, but that's about it. <laughs> And uh, so I said, okay, I'll, I guess I'll be a cop. And so they sent me to an army base for uh, a month in uh, arm, arms training, weapons training. And, uh, and from there, they, they said, well, where would you like to go? And, I, and a friend of mine was over in Germany, and he was going to beer fests and, you know, all kinds of stuff. And I said, okay, you know, I, I'd love to go to Europe and overseas, you know, Europe. And they said, okay. We'll send you to Maine. <laughs> they sent me to Loring Air Force Base, Maine, which I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. It's right at the tip of Maine. It's up there in the in the boonies, you know, one theater, etc. And girls over 16 are gone because there's nothing to do up there. You pick potatoes for extra money, and, and that was it. So it was cold as hell, and it was you walked flight line. I was security police, yeah. and you walked yeah. the flight line, and actually that's where Johnny Cash wrote his song. Uh, and uh, 
so anyway, uh, I volunteered for Southeast Asia, not knowing where I was going to get. Uh, it was either Southeast Asia, so you can go to Vietnam, you can go to Thailand, mm -hmm. anywhere in Southeast Asia. And uh, of course, I didn't tell my mom I volunteered. Uh, I volunteered for Southeast Asia, and they sent me to Thailand. My first base was uh, NKP, Nang Khao Phnom. But at that point in time, NKP was sort of kind of a secret base. Uh, they were raging a, a secret war in Laos, which mm -hmm. wasn't supposed to happen. wasn't happening if you talk to the right people. Right. And uh, But at that point in time, about 80% of all the airstrikes were coming out of, out of Thailand. And NKP was right on the Laotian border. I mean, you were like 20 clicks from the Mekong Trail. and. Uh, so we did a lot of going over to Laos and uh, guarding sites after A1Es went down or a helicopter went down or whatever. And now this is this is '67, and uh, they didn't really acknowledge NKP until a couple years later, I think. And so if you had gotten hurt or whatever, you couldn't really get a medal, you know, because you didn't exist. My mom had to write to an APO box. She didn't know where I was in Thailand. She didn't know where I was in Southeast Asia, actually. So that really freaked her out. And uh, so anyway, uh, I spent a year up there and came back. I said, well, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good with being out in the jungle and, and doing whatever for a year. Uh, I'd like to go to, uh, to New York or Massachusetts, get someplace close to home. Mm -hmm. So they sent me to Wyoming. <laughs> no, I knew there was a Wyoming. I just didn't know where the hell it was. You know, I'm like 19 years old. Yeah. What, the hell, you know, what do I know? You know, I'm Stratford, Connecticut. This is my world. And uh, so they sent me to Lawrence, uh, Loring, no, or, you know, Francis E. Warren Air Force Base in Wyoming. And then uh, I was a two striper, and uh, I was second class. And it's, now I'm in SAC again. And sack is all spit shine and creases and you know, so after being in Thailand for a year, there's no way in hell I can adapt to this. And uh, so it was a, uh, it was three days on, three days off. You go out into the field into Nebraska and, and Kansas and go out to the missile sites for three days, mm -hmm. guard them, patrol, all this good stuff, and then come back for three days. And we either go up into Wyoming or we go down into all the college towns in Colorado, which was wasn't bad, you know. But still, it was like it was sack. It was inspections every morning, and I, I got smart. I had bought, I had bought a pair of, uh, I got a pair of pair of boots made in Thailand that had patent leather toes and patent leather heels. So all I had to do was put a little Vaseline on. And I'm good to go. There, there was no spit shine in my you know, warm for inspections. Yeah. For morning inspection, etc., and uh, but still had to crease your pants, you know, mm -hmm. so you just rip it apart, and get into it real fast, yeah. don't go down the stairs. You yeah. Know? yeah. So I I was there for about three months, and I said I can't do this anymore, and I want to go back. So I and I knew the only way out of there was to volunteer for Southeast Asia. Anybody volunteer for Southeast Asia, you're going. And uh, so I volunteered for Southeast Asia again. My mom did not know. And uh, they kicked it back, said I couldn't go back to the same whatever in, in the same fiscal year. So I waited, and I waited, and finally that November I got chosen to go back to Thailand. And I went to Uban and, uh, for my last year. And uh, they sent me to Uban, and that, I got there in November of 70, November of 69, in 70, January, I think it was in January of 70, is one was the second sapper attack that that happened in Thailand, and that was uh, in Uban because the C-130 gunships were there, mm -hmm. and they won those gunships really bad, and uh, so I was on I was on a machine I was on a turret machine gunners for uh, in a uh, an APC that night, and we got deployed. I didn't do it. They killed five of them, and there was thirteen of them. They killed five, the rest of them got away. Uh, and uh, after that, they took me off that and they put me on, uh, I was roving patrol with my own Jeep and machine gunners and just went around and checked all the, the uh, dog handlers and stuff in the uh, 
towers. And then for my last six months, they put me in, I was a comptroller. Uh, so I was inside and worked well for me because it was monsoon season. And I said, well, okay, I'll go inside. And, uh, and we, had, we had quite a few, the Air Force bases in Thailand were getting quite a few alerts all the time because they just wanted the planes, mm -hmm. you know, so they come in and try to get them all the time. So, uh, and Uban was one of the hot spots. And so, but the only real thing that happened under my shift was uh, a F-4 Phantom came in one night and uh, didn't dump, blew, blew through the, blew through the hook, blew through the line, pickup lines, and ejected, his canopy went off, but the seat never went out, and ended up off the base underneath hooch. And so we had to evac, I had to evacuate the town and send out everybody and try to get this guy out of here without blowing half this U-Bahn up. And, uh, and then, uh, so that spent the rest of my night doing that, and that was fun. Uh, in the morning, they got him out safely. And in the morning, the base commander came and picked me up and he says, come here, I'll, I'll show you what you've, you've been doing all night. And he brought me out to there. There's this, this big ass jet sitting right underneath the hooch. You know, the poor guy who lived there. I mean, it was just perfectly like a garage. And, uh, but anyway, so then, uh, and I came home, which really wasn't a popular time to come home, uh, but I, I wanted to go to work for my dad. My dad owned a heating and air conditioning company okay. in Bridgeport, and, uh, but he didn't have an opening. He wasn't going to play favorites, so I said, okay, you know, get a job. So I went out and got a job uh, at uh, Smith's, P.J. Smith's, uh, doing marine construction. Okay. And uh, waiting for an opening. And finally, got in. and I was going to school nights. I was going to Bullard Havens okay. to learn heating and air conditioning. Let me, let me back up real quick, sure. though. Your first um, tour overseas, yep. okay, at the air base in, in Thailand, the, the base that didn't exist. At the yeah, time, exactly. Um, what was your day to day like? Was it basically just base security? By day to day, I worked both times I was in Thailand. I, I chose to work nights because anything's going to happen. That mm -hmm. I wanted a gun in my hands, and yeah. So I worked nights, and it basically was base security. You go out to the perimeter, and uh, for me, being a, a one striper, when I got there, it was just a jungle post. You know, we're going to stick you out right of the right of the fence lines in the jungle. You, you have this one, the next one over there, tie guards over there, and you spend eight or ten hours, however long the shift was, out there. And how were you tied into each other? Was it radio or field It was radio. Phone? Radio? It was radio. Okay. And uh, the ties being a real, a type of people that believed in uh, superstitions and things of that nature. Every once in a while they'd blow a tree away because they saw a ghost. And so that everybody get you know yeah, all excited. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, but other than that, nothing a lot happened. You also said about having to leave and, and go and um, secure crash sites. Yes. How would you get out to those crash sites? Uh, we we'd go by jeep. Okay. You know, usually just a three three convoy jeep. We'd go out there and find where where they crashed. And basically, it was just to guard the crash sites so that the locals wouldn't come in and, and loot all the plane parts and stuff like that because all the if there was any alive airmen left they'd already evacuated them right. okay. and uh, we crossed the Mekong and go over mm -hmm. and get it done uh, but at that point in time they were they were bombing I guess not as heavy as they did later on but they were bombing pretty heavy over there and we were sending uh, A1Es and C-47s from Thailand over there or Laotian C-47s and uh, but we could stand there at night and hear, you'd hear the jets come in, okay, and the rumble of the B-52. Then you wait five minutes and then you just feel the ground shake, you know. And uh, and then the jets come flying back and then later on the B-52 would come. But uh, they were pretty heavy and loud, loud. Uh, but, and then it was just, you know, I, I, we spent six days on one day off and we had a, and open air barracks, and, mm -hmm. and that was it. And what did you do? And in your one day, what did you what did you do? Oh, it's town, or just okay. play cards, you know. Okay. Mostly play cards, and uh, 
How did you stay in contact with your family at that point? There were just letters. Letters. And, you know, if, if, if one got through, I, my mom was pretty my mom was pretty much a writer. I would get kidded when we get letters because my mom would have, we send, we send it over, it takes a while to get there. But she would have her thoughts, she'd put them down on paper and then she'd think more about it. So she'd write it all around the border of the, the back of the envelope, you know, so all the guys were reading it, you know, and out the mail, you know. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story later about that. But um, yeah, that was the, just mail. And, okay. and you know, when I got home, she was thrilled. And when I told her I had to go back again, she wasn't so thrilled. She said, I thought you could, they wouldn't send you back. I said, ah, I don't know. I don't know nothing. You know, I'll just go where I'm told. And then the second tour to Thailand seemed like it was a little bit more um, hectic or interesting as far as the, uh, you know, the danger of the contact with the enemy and things of that nature. Yeah, it was. And it was, it was, um, we had more involvement hands on as far as the, the base wasn't as remote. You know, so we weren't, NKP was pretty much stuck in the jungle, jungle. and U Uban was more uh, modernized, uh, had a bigger air, air, airfield and air presence, uh, C-130s, C-111s, or uh, F-111s, F-4 uh, F Phantoms, and one other, I can't remember which one. Else. And uh, so we had, the, it was, it was, we had APCs and we had uh, commando cars, which we didn't, didn't have in NKP because again it was too remote, um, and then again <laughs> contact was via mail. But after my second year, this is my second year there. I, I sort of kind of, you know, was very comfortable going back there because I had been to Thailand before. So I was a little remiss in writing my mom, and so one day the, the clerk of the, office of the base commander came and got me and woke me up like 11 o'clock in the morning. I just went to bed at 8 and he woke me up and said, get dressed, you got to go see the base commander. I said, what the hell? So I went to see the base commander and, you know, I, I'm just a lowly priest striper, you know. And he says, uh, well, he says, I've got numerous letters from your mother saying that you're not writing her. And I said, Jeez, come on, Mom, you know, give me a break. And I'm just surprised that this all got through to him, you know? Yeah. But apparently it did. And so he made me, for the duration I was there, he made me have, write a letter once a week and deliver it to his office and put it on his <laughs> desk to show him that I was writing my mom. Well, that's good. And were you able to go out in town there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and again, after I came in from the field, uh, not too long after the sapper attack, I got, I got assigned to uh, the Jeep duty, going around to the gun sites and the towers. And then after that, I got more into the base security, on and off, doing the NCO clubs, the officers clubs, then going out to the clubs with a Thai guard or a Thai police and another, another uh, GI. And we'd go around to the clubs and stuff. So I was familiar with all the clubs, so our one day off, I had a really good friend of mine um, who actually worked for the base commander. We became friends, that clerk. And uh, my job was to protect him from the girls because he, 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 made, he, made, he made a promise to his wife to be faithful the whole time because he had just gotten married the whole time he was there, so it was my job to... To say, okay, Art, you know, you can't do this, can't be a drunk, but I'm taking you home, you know, and all that good stuff. But, um, yeah, mostly we go out to the clubs, and uh, a couple of us had, a, had got together, and we had, a, we had a place off base for a couple of months. <clears throat> but mostly, a lot of the times we weren't allowed to go off base. I'd probably say a good six to seven months of the of the 12 months I was there, we couldn't even go off base because of alerts. Oh, I was going to say for security yeah. reasons and, right. and things like that. Okay. Right. Okay, so your your last duty station again was where? Was Uban. Uban. World That's right. Tire, World and Tire. that time's coming for you to rotate back or, I guess, to stay in? And What was that decision maker for you? Uh, the decision was, at that point in time, I, I had been gone for a year. I had been at home for a year, my first year, wasn't happy with that placement, left, went to Thailand, went to come back home again, wasn't happy with that placement, went back to Thailand, 
and said, you know what, I'm done. Let me go home. Let me go. I miss my friends. I miss my family. Uh, it really didn't cross my mind to stay in. Okay. There. And not only that, is like I, I knew if I came, if I stayed in, they would send me back to the States and send me back to a SAC base, and I would be doing the same thing I left, you know, to get out of. And I didn't want that structure because when I was in Wyoming, they kept wanting me to take my, my uh, staff sergeant exam so they could move me up. And, but I didn't, I didn't want to do that, you know, I just didn't want to. And so that made my decision pretty easy just to get out. Okay. All right. um, good friends that you maintain contact with or not really? Not really. Did for the first couple of years. Okay. Well, actually, yeah, for the first couple of years we did. And then I have one friend um, who lived in Westport, I think, who I enlisted with. Or not enlisted with, but I had met when I got over in NKP. I've more or less stayed in contact with him. Uh, he lives down in Florida, and my friend Art, the clerk from the from the uh, base commander's office, we've been in contact on and off for the years. He lives in Hilton Head. But uh, other than that, no. And again, the guy I enlisted with, Art, we have lunch every three or four weeks. That's but he's a strapper boy. Okay. All right, great. All right, and you come home thinking that, you know, Dad's business is maybe your future, but Dad's kind of like, hey, you're going to wait your turn. Right. And so you start this other job, you go to school at Bullard Havens to, mm -hmm. to learn the trade, and, you know, what happens after that? Well, it finally got, a, got an opening, and so I went in as an apprentice and uh, got my own van. I was in service. I was going to be servicing this, this, this air conditioning and uh, heating units. And on paper at, at the tech, at Bullard Havens, it, was, it didn't seem to be much of a problem. Uh, I did pretty well when it came to paper, but when it actually came to doing, figuring out zone heating and things of that nature, uh, I wasn't that great at it. One of the guys that worked for my dad took me under his wing, but I really didn't have the confidence because I really wasn't, he could go, my dad did a lot of high-end houses in Westport and Wilton and Greenwich. And they're all three, four zone heating and air conditioning houses. And I was great in a small house with a small air conditioner. And I could, I could, I could pull an air conditioner out, recharge it, pull it back in again. And I could change motors and stuff on heaters. But when it comes to figuring out the electronics of how all this stuff worked, I wasn't that great. And so I did that for probably a little over a year. And then I was on call. And, I, and you're not supposed to be on call if you're an apprentice by yourself. But I was on call when it was a, it was a fall afternoon. And it was one of the nicer days right before winter, and we we're playing touch football down in Stratford. And I was on call. I called in. They said, "Oh, I've got a lady down in Westport who's, you know, screaming bloody murder because she's got no heat." Oh, beautiful day. Okay, well, that's my job. So I went. I go down to Westport, and uh, <clears throat> it's a lady I'd been to before. She got really nervous because her husband used to travel. But she's one of these people that are right over your shoulder all the time you're working. You know, so I'm down in the burner figuring this thing out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm pulling it out and everything's firing fine, you know, clean the electrodes, put it back in again, and fired it a couple times. And she said, I'm so afraid of fire, I'm so afraid of fire. Otherwise, Okay, you know, I got you. I'm going to take care of you. I said, there's so many fail safes on this thing that you're never going to catch fire. And uh, so I go, I go back, meet my friends. By that time, they're done playing football. They went to the bars, so I went to the bars. And it's 11 o'clock, and I said, oh, crap, I forgot to call in my, my service. I call in the service, and of course, there's no cell phones in. You have to call in. And I said, we've been looking for you for hours. And I said, what's the problem? And he says, well, that house you're at, furnace caught fire. <laughs> what had happened was, oh, and I didn't know this before I went out there, but they had problems with, there's an eye, that if the electrodes on the oil burner, if the oil shoots and doesn't, doesn't come ignited, it doesn't see light, so it'll shut down the oil. Well, they had had problems with this electrode, and what happened is this thing dumped oil for about three hours, and then they ignited. And it basically, I was really lucky, or she was really lucky, 
that the house didn't burn down. It, it was all hardwood floors. It just it melted the furs and scorched all the hardwood floors through the ductwork. But I mean, the, the fire department's out there, the police department's out there, fire chief is out there, and they're screaming bloody murder. And I'm on the phone in the, in the diner, you know, shaking in my boots. And I called my dad, woke him up, I said, Dad, we, we got a problem. <laughs> so he immediately called the service manager and had Sir meet. He said, come home, we'll get your truck. So I came home, got the truck, and we met the service manager at the house. And it, it was, it was just, his furniture just melted down to nothing. I mean, it was just, it was so hot. And, but I couldn't walk into a house after that I, on my own. I couldn't, I couldn't. Right. I, my, my confidence was shot 100%. So three days later, I went to my dad and said, Dad, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't do this. I can't. Yeah. And he said, no, I understand, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I said, fine. So I saw an ad in the paper for a company called Friendly Frost. They were a, a TV and appliance outlet that was out of New York, but they had a store in, uh, in Bridgeport at... Uh, There was a mall in Bridgeport right by Father Penny Village. I don't remember the name of it. Anyway, for an air conditioner salesman, you know, I said, well, if I can fix them, I can sell them. Mm -hmm. you know, so I went and applied there, and, and that just jump-started a 40-year career of selling electronics and appliances and That's awesome. stuff like that. And what about family? Did you ever get married? I did. Kids, I, got married, um, I got married. The first time we got married, I've been married twice. The first time I got married, um, I met a girl from Bridgeport. We got married. Uh, I moved to Colorado and worked for an appliance company out there and ended up getting divorced out there. Col I went to Colorado because a few friends of mine were going out there, and I had been out there when mm -hmm. I was in the service, so I was familiar with it. And I said, oh, it's a nice country, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I went out there. Anyway, I ended up getting divorced out there. My job took way too much of my time. It wasn't was their fault, it was my fault. And so then I came back and uh, never had, well, I shouldn't say, she miscarried. And we had, had, had kids, she got pregnant, she miscarried, and after that, things had all gone downhill. And uh, so after that, I came home and, and spent the next 20 years single, I guess, until I met my current wife in 2006 and uh, got married again. We don't have any kids. She has three kids. And uh, ended up, uh, again, working in high-end appliances and electronics uh, for 40 years. My last place was, uh, was All-American Appliance and I worked for P.C. Richards and ended up at P.C. Richards and retired in 2017. And what do you do with your time now? Um, you know, it seems like you should have lots of time, <laughs> but all of a sudden, like, where did the day go? You know, and I don't do a lot. I mean, I read a lot. I exercise as much as I can. I'm president of the condo board, the uh, condo association where I live. Okay. Um, I had a meeting this morning with the roofers. Uh, it was just, you know, a meeting with the treasurer. It's like all of a sudden, your time is not your own, you know. <laughs> and between that and doctor's appointments, you know, <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, I play cribbage every every afternoon, every Wednesday afternoon. A friend of mine is a senior center who I, I I've known forever. That's good. And again, I play. I heard how to play cribbage when I was over in Thailand, and uh, so we do that on Wednesdays, and. Uh, yeah, stuff like that. You know, nothing. I don't have any other major hobbies. Uh, when COVID hit, we were, oh, I, I moved to uh, Arizona for two years. I had a house in Lordship, two houses down from where I grew up. And uh, my wife has family, a brother <clears throat> out in California, and a sister in Arizona. I have an older brother in Arizona. And she said, you know, I've never really been able to be close to my brother or my sister because they live so far away and the kids were not up. So a friend of ours from across the street in Lordship had just moved her mom out there and she said, well, why don't, 
we look at that. She has some nice 55 year old communities. And uh, now I understand I was at the, I was on the house where I was on the street where I wanted to live, the house I wanted yeah. to live. And I've been working my whole life to get back here. <laughs> and uh, I said, okay, you know, I can go or I can stay, you know. And she said, let's go. We can go for a few years, you know, and, and until you're like 75 or so, and then if we don't like it, we can come back. And uh, we went, and COVID hit, like six months later. And everything shut down, as you know, and uh, her kids were back here, and all of a sudden she couldn't see her kids for two years, and that was a non-starter. So she woke up in the morning and said, you're going to kill me. I said, what? She said, I want to go home. I said, okay. <laughs> And I said, well, let's wait until, because back then it, there was no vaccine or anything yet. And I said, well, let's wait until, you know, 2021 or wherever it was. And two weeks later, she woke up and said, you're going to kill me. I said, what? She said, I want to go home now. And I said, okay. You know, and by, at that point, the market was crazy. The housing market was just insane. I couldn't touch my old house with a 10-foot pole. Mm -hmm. So we ended up buying a condo, and lucky we got that. Uh, over in uh, Stratford, and uh, but anyway, um, I got off track, off topic there. Uh, <laughs> uh, went to Arizona, came back. I'm here, uh, just doing stuff, you okay. know. Nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. Nothing spectacular. I won the men's club over at, over in Senior Center and stuff like that. How would you? Um, how would you? Or how do you think your your military experience overall uh, helped to influence your life later on? I tell you, you know, and there's so many times I thought, you know, you think to yourself, would if I if I had a choice, would I ever do it again? And I would. I I guess I can say I enjoyed it to a point. Mm -hmm. You know, I enjoyed. Um, you grow up, and, and I had a, a good group of friends here. You know, as much as you can have when you're 16, 17 yeah. in school and whatnot, you know. But going into the service, all of a sudden you're meeting people from all over the place. And uh, Joe Alphabet, whose name I couldn't even pronounce because he's from Jersey, you know. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Stuff like that. And you meet these people and within the, and you only know them for a year or less. And then you move on for the next year from Air Force, which four years. And, uh, but you make friendships like you've known them your whole life mm -hmm. because you depend on one another and you bond with with uh, same experiences and same problems and same bitches and moans and gripes and and whatnot and same joys and and whatnot and it was it was quite the experience it really was and um and it, again if anything like especially my last year in thailand being a comptroller when the base Basically, the base security was in my hand, and the red button was underneath the dash in case I needed to wake everybody up and tell them we're getting hit, and everybody has to do whatever, yeah. and it was in my control, and to send people into harm's way or not. And it gave me a, um, a feel of leadership and a confidence in mm -hmm. leadership that later on, uh, not that it's in any way, shape, or form the same, but to put me into man into management positions, and realize what and not just going into management from not ever being there, but from doing that, realizing you're only as good as the people around you. You know, you can only get the job done if they can get the job done, and so it's not about you mm -hmm. at all. It's about them, and so that was always my philosophy. You know, I don't care if you want to be as strong as me or as good as me. Please be. You know, it's making my job easier. So I can go help the next person. Absolutely. Uh, and so that's what it gave me more than anything else, I think. All right. Uh, is there anything we didn't talk about today that you think is important for everybody to know? Uh, no, I, I, feel, I feel a sense of, of pride going into the service at that point in time, mm -hmm. whether my circumstances warranted or not. Would, you know, the decision I don't think the decision entirely was forced on me, you know, it was just the times. And if I was another point in time or another place in time, if I was asked to do it, I'd probably do it again. Uh, and I, I feel a, a tremendous amount of pride being in the United States and living here and, and serving in the armed forces and, and wearing the uniform and 
I respect all who do and all who did and all who will because uh, it's, it's not something that, that is for everybody, but it's something that we need. And uh, yeah, I like that. Well, I thank you for your service to our country and thank you for sharing your story. Well, thank you for letting me talk. Yeah.